Hello and welcome to Health in the Heartland, a program dedicated to the health issues that affect you. I'm Karen Blake Glock, and joining me this episode is Dr. Carl Tadaki, General Surgeon with Surgical Specialist of Heart and Memorial Health. Thanks for being with us today. Good morning, and thanks for having me. Good. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, our topic today is actually minimally invasive surgery. What is the difference between minimally invasive surgery and traditional surgeries? Well, I'm glad you asked. Minimally invasive surgery is taking the traditional open operation where you, where you have one large incision and converting it to either laparoscopic, robotic, or even endoscopic surgery. And that means a uh, few small incisions or no incisions at all, depending on how advanced of a technology that we're using. Um, so the traditional, like I said, you, you may have a six to a foot long uh, incision versus half an inch to an inch incision multiple places in your abdomen. Now when we say laparoscopic too, that is, is that a tiny scope? What, what does that actually mean? It does. It's, it's about a, either a five millimeter or a 10 millimeter uh, camera that we use to look inside your abdomen uh, to allow us the visualization that we would typically have if the abdomen was open wide with the large incision. So it makes life a lot easier to see. Well, I heard you say abdomen. Does minimally invasive surgery just generally mean the abdo abdominal area? No. Uh, minimally invasive surgery can be anywhere from the abdomen to the chest, um, depending on what type of surgeon that you are. So thoracic surgeons obviously are operating in the chest cavity, and people like myself, general surgeons, uh, are ap operating more in the abdominal cavity. Now, when we talk about the surgery, what type of surgeries can be called minimally invasive surgeries? What are the typical types of surgeries? Just about anything and everything that we do open, we can do minimally invasively. Um, the traditional operations or the most common ones that we do are laparoscopic gallbladder removals or laparoscopic cholecystectomies, uh, appendectomies, and as the training is progressed, as the technology is progressed, uh, we have converted colon operations or colon resections to laparoscopic or robotic. Um, taking out somebody's spleen, bariatric surgery has probably been one of the largest uh, conversions from open operations to minimally invasive. Now, what are the advantages then of, of having a minimally invasive surgery versus doing it, I think you called it open? Right. Um, the most obvious one is cosmetic. That's the first and foremost. Um, rather than having a large scar down the middle of your abdomen, you have a few small incisions. So cosmetically and aesthetically, it's a lot more pleasing to the eye. Second, the recovery rate is a lot quicker. Because you don't have a large incision splitting your abdomen wide open, the recovery rate, rate uh, is significantly quicker. The pain is a lot less. Um, the chance of complications from the actual incision, such as hernia formations, are significantly less. Your length of stay in the hospital is less. Um, and the operation itself, uh, within the abdomen, you develop a lot less scar tissue as well. Uh, so for example, when we used to do bariatric surgery open, uh, people would stay in the hospital typically five to seven days. Now they're out of the hospital in roughly two days. Mm -hmm. And so you see there's a significant difference uh, as far as length of stay. If we have to go back into the abdomen to operate, there's a lot less scar tissue, so that operation takes a lot less time as well. Um, as an example, I had a patient who had a open hernia repair, and we did a bariatric operation on her because of the scar tissue that doubled the length of time within the op operating room as compared to the average bariatric patient with no surgery previously. Um, so can minimally invasive surgery also be outpatient too? Absolutely. So okay. gallbladder removals, mm -hmm. um, hernia repairs that we do uh, both uh, within the abdominal cavity, so ones that are called ventral hernias or incisional hernias, uh, as well as inguinal hernias, those can be done laparoscopically as well. Uh, from a person who's had an open inguinal hernia repair before, it can be very painful and common comments made by um, myself in the past when I used to do open operations as well as uh, my mentors 
we would say, well, you have one incision versus three small incisions that add up to the one incision. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you from having an open operation, I can see the big difference in uh, simply aesthetics of, of a larger scar versus mm -hmm. a couple of smaller scars that will disappear throughout time. Well, I think you said the other big key issue is just recovery time. You're going to hopefully feel better because you haven't had as much, I, I guess, I hate to use the word trauma. What, what would be the word uh, after be a, opening the good the cavity? That's a perfect word, trauma, because that's surgery is trauma to, mm -hmm. to the abdominal wall, to the patient. Um, it's a fairly harsh word, but mm -hmm. that's what it is. It's an right. insult to the body. So the less we do, the quicker people can recover. Excellent. And I think everybody wants to feel better rather quickly and get back to their quality of life that we want them to have the Absolutely. best that they can. So tell us what are the credentials actually for a surgeon to do minimally invasive surgery? Well, majority of the time it's just your training. So whether um, you did a lot of laparoscopy while you were in training as a, as a resident, whether you went on to more training during your fellowship like myself, um, it all really depends on your mentors in the past. Um, is that something to, see, I was going to say, is that something to discuss with your physician when you go in to talk and you hear the word you're, you need surgery? Should they ask, is this something that can be done minimally invasively? Absolutely. I, I think minimally invasive surgery is uh, not only in the present, but it's also the future of surgery as a whole. Um, you should ask your sur surgeon if you're interested, if the operation can be performed laparoscopically. Mm -hmm. Now, what I do say to all the patients is that you want an operation that the surgeon is comfortable performing. Mm -hmm. So if the surgeon is not comfortable performing a laparoscopic operation, uh, then you want them to do the open operation. Now, don't get me wrong, open operations are excellent. There's a time and a place for everything that we do. Um, and it depends on the condition, right? It exactly, right. it depends on the condition. If the surgeon uh, has excellent results with an open operation, they probably do not want to change to a minimally invasive operation, and that's perfectly fine. Now, if you have a surgeon that's trained uh, in minimally invasive surgery or laparoscopic surgery, then it's an option, and I think it's an excellent option and an, uh, one for the future. Um, colon resections are, are very popular uh, amongst laparoscopic surgeons. Uh, popular may not be the word, but um, it's, a, it's common. a common case amongst, <laughs> especially the colorectal surgeons. Within the country, less than 50% are done minimally invasively. And within the laparoscopic community, we're asking ourselves, why is this the case? Because it can be done minimally invasively. And part of it is the comfort level of, of the surgeon. Again, an open operation for a colon resection is still um, standard of care. But when it can be done safely, minimally invasively, uh, the option, in my opinion, should be done minimally invasively. Um, again, length of stay, patient's uh, pain after the operation and recovery are a lot better when done minimally invasively. Well, and I think as they're discussing going into um, what the expectations are, obviously, of the surgery and discussing with their recovery time, et cetera, Discussing that with the surgeon, Correct. saying I may go in with minimally invasive surgery, it may then result in open pending what happens once you get in there. Because Correct. you really don't know sometimes until you get in and see what's going on. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. I have that conversation with all my patients. Mm -hmm. um, I will always tell them we'll start off minimally invasively right. or laparoscopically. And if it is not safe to continue on laparoscopically, we will convert to an open operation and make it a safe operation. No matter what type of operation all these patients have, you want the safest operation possible. And I always tell the patients, um, and this is a, a little bit morbid, but you'd rather wake up with a large incision than not wake up with small incisions. Right. And I think when put that way, everybody understands, yes, cosmetically it would be nicer if I had a couple of small mm -hmm. incisions, but I'd rather be alive with a larger incision. We talked a little bit about the future. So I know we've advanced from, you know, in the last, is it, I don't know, 10, 15 years that we went from open to the it's minimally invasive. Where are we 10, 15 years from now? Uh, well, actually, laparoscopy has probably been around nowadays about 20, 30 years. Has it? Oh, yes, goodness. Yes, it, <laughs> okay. it, it's the time's flying by quite quickly. Um, and in the future, um, right now, robotic surgery has come about. 
uh, the urologist and the gynecologic oncologist have utilized the uh, robot extensively and has become a standard of care for them in a lot of their operations. General surgery is looking at the use of the robot and how we can effectively and efficiently use this robot um, technology to advance our care. So that's one, um, and that's been around for about 10 plus years as well, the, mm -hmm. the robot. So we're still looking, and down the line, that may become more mainstream uh, surgery practice for us. Um, but also there's something called natural orifice surgery where um, you use, you have a scarless operation where you go through the natural orifice of the body, whether it be the mouth or the anus, to perform the operation. And people are doing this at large universities throughout the country to see if it's a feasible and safe option. And uh, there are some folks that are doing some excellent work uh, in this field. So this is kind of the up and coming study to see where we might be Correct. evolving. Correct. Oh. And so, you know, within the next couple of years, there may be a handful of operations uh, that will go through um, one of our orifices and we come out with, with no uh, scars. Um, a mentor of mine is also working on um, possibly robots that you place into the abdomen that do the work while you sleep and take it out after it's done. So you have one incision and these mini robots working on it. Now again, this seems like a lot of science fiction, mm -hmm. but there, there are folks out there working on the science fiction to make it a reality. Ever-changing, and I think that's ever-changing for the um, care of the patient, mm -hmm. the recovery time, their outcomes, and then also just, um, I guess, quicker recovery time, correct, in uh, the long uh, run, too. Absolutely. You know, the, the hospital is the best place to be when you're sick, mm -hmm. but probably one of the worst places to be when you're healthy. That's right. And to feel better and recover, I think majority of us would rather be in the comforts of our own home Absolutely. and our own bed rather than in a hospital bed with uh, lights and buzzers going off. So if we can get the patients out of the hospital a little quicker and recover at home safely, that's the ultimate goal. So as a surgeon, we've, we've been talking about um, the actual surgery process. What tips do you have for our viewers as they come to the doctor? What questions, you know, and how should they maybe prepare for that visit in, in asking um, what, what their expectations might be? You know, I think everybody should, should do their research online as far as um, the type of surgeon they're going to, the credentials of the surgeon, and also as you, and the actual operation mm -hmm. of what they're interested in. Now, as we all say, you know, believe half of what you read, especially on the internet, mm -hmm. but the internet is filled with a lot of great information. When you go to the surgeon and you talk about the expectations of the operation, uh, you should ask them all potential questions that you may have as far as the operation itself, anything that they have to do before the operation to prepare to have good outcomes down the line, and also what to expect afterwards as far as pain, um, scars, incisions, and limitations of their activity once the operation's done. Well, you know, I, I really heard you say being informed, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's the internet or just being prepared to ask the questions, do read the pamphlet that the physician might hand you, you know, the educational mm -hmm. information. And, you know, that truly makes you and it empowers you to be a wise healthcare consumer and a partner with your healthcare provider as you prepare for the care. Absolutely. Um, an informed patient is probably the best patient that I mm -hmm. have. Uh, those that, that understand the risks of the operation, but also see the benefit of it, they will truly appreciate the operation that they're about to undergo. Um, I tell all my patients, all operations are elective. Now, there may mm -hmm. be some that we encourage patients to have a, a little quicker because of the life-threatening aspect of mm -hmm. it, but they're all elective operations. And in being an elective operation, just as if you go out and buy a car, you don't just trust the person that's selling you the car. You go out and mm -hmm. do your research, uh, you look at the details and the specs of, of the cars that you're looking at, and, and you realize what you wanna pay to purchase the car. Same thing with going to see a mm -hmm. physician of any sorts, whether it be a surgeon, an internist, or, or, or what may have, uh, you know, what's out there. You want to see what is available to you, what are your options, uh, and the quality of care that you're going to receive from the physician. 
And if you're unsatisfied, uh, you should go and look somewhere else. I would assume too, as they you know prepare for that surgery, having the list of medications, knowing what their normal activity level mm -hmm. is, those are things that are discussed um, in that visit. And generally, we hear a term in the medical field called NPO, not mm -hmm. having anything to eat or drink. So that's a discussion as you get ready for your surgery on the day before of or the day of. And so when they really ask you not to eat or drink anything, that is imperative, correct? Absolutely, uh, and that's actually a standard put out by our anesthesia colleagues. Um, when we ask people not to eat or drink anything after a certain time, it's simply because we're trying to prevent um, them from vomiting and aspirating uh, mm -hmm. the food contents into their lungs at the time of the anesthetic. Uh, because once they're induced, they're paralyzed and they have no protective mechanism to um, stop the, the food from coming up and, and being sucked back into their lungs. Um, the operation may be extremely simple, but the complications after the fact, because you aspirated, you could be in the hospital for weeks, months, or maybe not even wake up due to the severity of the aspiration of, of the pneumonia that develops. That well, and, it, and it can delay your, your, <coughs> your actual surgery if you come to the hospital and say, oops, I forgot to eat, you know, and I went ahead and ate right. at this time. So it can, it can delay it down the road. So really, those are given for reasons of, you know, safety and making sure that everything's going to lessen the complications in the long run. So yes, indeed. That's important. Anything else you'd like to share with us regarding minimally invasive surgery this episode? You know, I, I think the main thing and the main point I'd like to get across is that minimally invasive surgery is um, a proven method of operating. It's safe and effective, um, and it has a lot of benefits that open operations cannot provide, mainly the recovery, the pain, and cosmetics. All that being said, uh, when you talk to your surgeon, if they are not comfortable providing a minimally invasive operation, you either find a sec another physician or you go along with what they feel comfortable with mm -hmm. because the main thing is you want a safe operation more than anything else, more than uh, looking good afterwards, more than uh, you know not staying in the hospital as long, you want a safe operation. And so if you try to convince your surgeon to perform an operation minimally invasively and he or she is not comfortable doing that, uh, you are actually putting yourself in harm's way. So I think the bottom line is whether it, the operation is performed minimally invasively, uh, which is my preference, versus a large open operation, um, we all, in the end, want a safe operation. Dr. Taraki, thank you for being here with us today, and we hope our viewers have had an opportunity to learn a little bit more about minimally invasive surgery. For more information, you can go to our website at www.hmh.net. And again, thank you for joining us on Health in the Heartland.